you look at it from the social point of view and the economic point of view and the environmental point of view and the energy issues, oh, the pace of development and so on, you know, we can't go on doing business the way we used to do it. We have to have, have new, new theoretical positions too. It's not just we, we're coming up with new models, but we just have to take apart the whole issue of urbanism and the interconnected aspects of this and start building new theories. MIT is composed of uh, extremely powerful individuals with strong minds in their own areas, people with uh, specified expertise, but all of whom are quite comfortable with friction and uncertainty. And this is actually what brings out the best in these collaborations. In order to make a better product, you have to fail many times to make it, make it better. And that's something that I always found extremely refreshing about this place, is that the risk-taking is part of this culture. You don't always have to be sure what will be the outcome. You can. The mission of the center is to focus and develop the knowledge about how to design, build and project on the very large scale. The question is, can we use the tools, techniques and methods of architecture or of urban design as we know it? The answer is probably not. We can't just scale up. New uh, forms and new templates have to be invented. We organize this through research, interdisciplinary research, whether it's hydrology or real estate or transportation planning or emergency disaster planning and design can then weave a thread and project that output as a truly interdisciplinary, best for all, for the common good uh, future project. Our mappings make visible the problems that otherwise may be too large to see or too remote in time to appreciate in the present day. Spillover effects are effects that no one really accounted for when they were making their initial calculations. If you're going to act on those second impacts or on the, on the spillover effects or the unintended consequences, that you have to be able to see them. You have to be able to register them with your own eyes. Once they're revealed, we may act upon them today. We may create projects. We can create formulas to solve the problems at both scales. I don't believe in a place like MIT that you can talk about and teach large-scale environmental problems without first-hand experience, seeing them, walking through them, and seeing the impacts that humans have made in the past. We can understand cities in a scale that we've never been able to before. Cities are collecting new data, mass amounts of data. I'm really interested in how we can use that and translate that for a public good. So what we did is develop a particulate matter sensor, and then we gave that to Associated Press reporters to do their press reports uh, during the Beijing Olympics. You have object makers and system thinkers coming together, and sometimes there's a clash, and what we try to do is catalyze the clash of those two concepts. Within the center, we have vigorous debate between different positions about the future of city form. One position in favor of large, open, suburban meshes. Another one for patchwork urbanism, infill, in decaying and shrinking cities. And a third one favoring dense development along infrastructural trunk lines. People now are driving from suburb to suburb and not from suburb to center city. That is the interurban model. In some of the cities we studied, 87% of all suburban trips stayed within the suburbs. They never went to the central city. In my mind, the shrinking city represents a new kind of urban project. Far from being an effort to reconstitute the city or an effort to destroy and rebuild the city, the urban project of the shrinking city acknowledges the inevitable decline and opening up of the urban fabric and yet projects the recreation of a certain kind of urbanity that acknowledges the potential for new forms of urbanization. What if the mobility network were to be remade as a hybrid, coordinated, bundled, multimodal system? The bundle brings together formerly disparate car, regional rail, and freight infrastructures so that they may work together.
whether people drive a hybrid or a totally an electric car, the question is where do you where do you park it and how you park it. So for every car in the United States, we have about three parking spaces. So that's already you might argue is uh, is way more than we need. But when you see it covered as a farmers market or when you see people playing uh, football or soccer on those, then you might say, well, um, wait a minute, that parking lot actually does provide a certain function. Some people really believe that there's a future for surface parking and are eloquent experts for it like Iran. Other people, like Ken Larson, develop an entirely new car system that actually advocate a gradual elimination of parking altogether and favor other, more compacted forms of, uh, of car parking. Our group at the MIT Media Lab is developing a concept that we call Mobility on Demand, designed to address what transportation planners call the first mile, last mile problem of mass transit systems. car folds such that its length is equal to the width of a normal car, allowing it to go nose first into a parallel parking space, achieving three cars to every conventional automobile. To me, Brazilian infrastructure is more about the services that infrastructure provides. The first is robustness and the second is resiliency. Um, these two dimensions aim to maintain the functioning of the system while simultaneously maintaining the capability for us to change and adapt to unforeseen circumstances, that is, the future that we do not know. So what's really exciting about working with a larger agency like the World Bank is that we really feel that we can make a difference within the developing world. Um, the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery states that low-income countries account for only 9% of the world's disasters, but 48% of the fatalities. So the more we can anticipate hazards and build preparedness into everyday design, the more we can empower the residents and make the awareness become part of the development cycle. The monies that go into the interstate system may in fact be routed through the design agency to bring synthesis to a larger vision that also includes engineers. Today's pressing environmental problems create a tremendous challenge for designers. The scales and complexity of our environmental challenges have forced a professional awakening, a shockwave of self-evaluation and disciplinary responsibility. I work specifically on energy efficient building design. So we have to look at urban microclimate in better detail, have to understand how buildings together change the weather around you effectively. And then, well, how can we translate this back into information that architects and planners can use. I think at the national level, pretty obviously the most urgent priority is a price on carbon, and more broadly a price on all the natural services that we use. But at the local level, I think the most urgent priority is to really transform the institutional context of cities. We've started thinking about uh, environmental problems and urbanism at a regional scale, and there's always been a demand for it, but there's never been much of a supply of really innovative ideas and approaches. So here's an opportunity for the Center for Advanced Urbanism to really take a different kind of approach. If you bring the political in, if you bring the economic in, if you bring the design in, put them all together, a lot of potential. <laughs>